tonight. High stakes showdown. Trump and Harris face off in a heated debate in Philadelphia, with pre-debate polls placing Democratic and Republican candidates neck and neck in the race. Twenty years after, U.S. remembers the lives taken and reshaped in the 9/11 attacks and events in a heart-touching ceremony. West against. The U.S. imposes new sanctions on Iran over supplying missiles to Russia, while Iran threatens actions over the Western sanctions. And detecting blaze. An award-winning innovation tackles the global issue of wildfire detection with an efficient, eco-friendly approach to wildfire management. All that and more, as well news tonight, starts right now. This is Ava Derna World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here's Vinuth Warnasuria. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Well, we have lots of key updates on stories across the globe and we start today's bulletin on the road to the White House. <music> Donald Trump and Kamala Harris engaged in one of the biggest showdowns in the history of the US elections early morning today. Democratic candidate Kamala Harris seemingly put her Republican rival Donald Trump on the offensive in a combative presidential debate with a stream of attacks on economy, immigration, abortion and on some personal topics. After weeks of arguments over the format and rules, the first presidential debate between Donald Trump and Kamala Harris took place in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, a key swing state. Both candidates went into the event virtually tied in the polls in search of a campaign-altering moment. In their first presidential debate, former United States President Donald Trump and Vice President Kamala Harris both accused each other of fueling division in America. The candidates quickly dived into contentious issues from migration and fracking to Israel's war on Gaza, but there were no groans or rapturous applause as the pair spoke without a live audience at the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Around the country through, millions of Americans watched on from their living rooms while outside the official debate venue in Philadelphia, protesters called for Harris to earn their vote with a ceasefire in Gaza. Today, the 11th of September, will mark the 23rd anniversary of the 9-11 attacks on the United States when nearly 3,000 people were killed when hijacked jetliners crashed into the World Trade Center, the Pentagon and a field in Pennsylvania on the 11th of September 2001. Americans watched in horror as the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001 left nearly 3,000 people dead in New York City, Washington, D.C. and Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Nearly 20 years later, the enduring power of the September 11 attacks is clear. An overwhelming share of Americans who are old enough to recall the day remember where they were and what they were doing when they heard the news. Yet, an overgrowing number of Americans have no personal memory of that day, either because they were too young or not yet born. In New York City, a ceremony took place at the 9-11 memorial where mourners gathered as they have every year since the attack for the annual reading of victims' names. Throughout the ceremony, six moments of silence were observed, acknowledging when each of the World Trade Center towers was struck and fell and the times corresponding to the attack on the Pentagon and the crash of United Airlines Flight 93. Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda claimed responsibility for the suicide attacks and a US-led war in Afghanistan followed. Updates from Vietnam now. As the super typhoon Yagi wrecks havoc across the Asia, at least 127 people have now died and 54 others are missing in northern Vietnam. According to officials, heavy rainfall, more landslides and flooding are expected. Thousands of people were seen stranded on rooftops in some northern provinces, while others posted desperate pleas for help on social media yesterday. Although it has now weakened into a tropical depression, authorities have warned Yagi will create more disruption as it moves westwards. The storm, which brought winds of nearly 150 km per hour, has damaged bridges, torn roofs off buildings, damaged factories and triggered widespread flooding and landslides, leaving 64 people still missing. 
Authorities have now issued flood and landslide warnings for 401 communes across 18 northern provinces. One story homes in parts of Taiguan and Yanbai provinces were almost completely submerged in the early hours yesterday. As well as the dead and missing, flooding and landslides have also injured at least 752 people, according to the Ministry of Agriculture. Before hitting Vietnam, Yagi left 24 people dead across southern China and the Philippines. Pope Francis touched down in Singapore for the final leg of his trip through Asia, arriving in one of the world's most richest countries from one of its poorest after a record-setting final mass in the East Timor. The Pope was greeted at Singapore's Changi Airport by senior officials such as Ministry of Culture Edwin Tong. Later, he was received by four children donning national costumes, each welcoming him in one of four Singapore's official languages, Malay, English, Tamil and Mandarin. Pope Francis is expected to spend two days in Singapore, departing on Friday. His visit will include a speech to political authorities and a mass at the National Stadium, which the Vatican expects to draw some 55,000 people. He will also hold private meetings with President Tarman Shangaratnam, Prime Minister Lawrence Wong and former Prime Minister Lee Zian Lung. Pope Francis is only the second pope to visit Singapore following a brief five-hour layover by the late John Paul II in 1986. The country counts about 210,000 Catholics among its 5.92 million people according to the Vatican. The Pope arrived from Dili, East Timor's capital, where on Tuesday he celebrated Mass with an estimated 600,000 of the country's 1.3 million population in one of the largest ever turnouts as a proportion of a country's population for a Mass during a papal visit. Iranian President Masoud Peseshkian visited Iraq today on his first foreign trip. The visit signals his intention to strengthen ties with a strategic ally of both Tehran and Washington as the tensions rise in the Middle East. Upon his arrival, he was greeted by Iraqi Prime Minister Mohammad Shia al-Sudani during a welcoming ceremony at Baghdad's airport. Pazeshkian, who was elected in July, met Iraqi Prime Minister Mohammad Shia al-Sudani at the start of a visit that Baghdad said would include the signing of a number of agreements and discussion of the Gaza war and the situation in the region. State media have said Pazeshkian also plans to visit Iraqi Kurdistan, a region where Iran has carried out strikes in the past, saying it is used as a staging ground for Iranian separatist groups as well as agents of its arch foe, Israel. Baghdad has tried to tackle Iranian concerns over regional separatist groups, moving to relocate some members in a 2023 security pact with Tehran. And let's go for a short commercial break now. More world news right after this. Welcome back. US Secretary of State Antony Blinken joined by UK Foreign Secretary David Lammy and said that the US would impose fresh sanctions on Iran, accusing the country of sending short-range ballistic missiles to Russia to be used in Ukraine. Well, further adding, he also said it was a move swiftly replicated by the UK, France and Germany. However, Iran rejected the accusation which it called lies and propaganda used to cover up Western countries' armed support to Israel. Allies said the move represents a substantial escalation in its two-and-a-half-year-old conflict, as they formally accused Iran of supplying short-range ballistic missiles to Russia to use in the war. France, the UK and Germany issued a joint statement calling the missile transfers a direct threat to European security and said they would also impose sanctions on Tehran. The White House said these will include restrictions to Iran air commercial flights between European cities and Iran. A foreign Ministry spokesman on Tuesday calling it lies and propaganda to cover up the armed support of some Western countries to Israel. The Kremlin said Monday that it was developing dialogue with Iran in all areas. Till now, Iranian military support for Moscow has been limited mainly to unmanned Shahed attack drones, which are slower than ballistic missiles, so easier to shoot down and carry a fraction of the explosives. For its part, Ukraine described sanctions against Iran as a positive step, while arguing that it should now be allowed to conduct strikes deeper into Russian territory. 
Ukraine took the war home to Russia, striking the Moscow region with 144 drones in the largest such attack to date. The attack killed one person and set homes ablaze, forcing the city's four airports to remain shut for several hours. Russia said it downed at least 20 of Ukraine's drones as they swarmed over the Moscow region, which has a population of over 21 million. Footage from the city's Ramanskoya district showed fires breaking out in homes after drones damaged high-rise apartment buildings. And according to Moscow's regional governor, it was in this district that a woman was killed and three people were injured. Yulia Rodionova is a resident in the area. Her windows were shattered and a fragment of a drone was left on her balcony. Russia's defence ministry said over 70 drones were also downed over the Bryansk region and tens more over other regions. Three of Moscow's four airports were closed for more than six hours and almost 50 flights were diverted. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said that the strike on Moscow shows the quote Kyiv regime is Russia's enemy and Russia needs to keep fighting. Kyiv said Russia, which sent tens of thousands of troops into Ukraine in February 2022, had attacked it overnight with 46 drones, 38 of which were destroyed. As Russia advances in eastern Ukraine, Kyiv has taken the war to Russia. It has executed a cross-border attack in Russia's western Kursk region, which began early last month. And it has been carrying out increasingly large drone attacks deep into Russian territory. Australia plans to set a minimum age requirement for social media use by children due to the health concerns, but digital right groups warn it might drive harmful behaviour underground. Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese said his government will run an age verification trial before setting rules later this year. He didn't specify an age, but said it would probably be between 14 and 16. The law would make Australia one of the first countries to set a minimum age. Similar efforts, like those by the EU, have failed due to concerns about limiting minors' online rights. Meta, owner of Facebook and Instagram, says it aims to help youth benefit from its platforms and support parents rather than just restrict access. According to government and industry data, Australia has one of the world's most online populations with 80% of its 26 million people on social media. A 2023 study found that 75% of Australians aged 12 to 17 had used YouTube or Instagram. Albanese announced the age restriction plan during a parliamentary inquiry into social media's impact on teens' mental health. The inquiry raised concerns about enforcing a lower age limit and whether it might harm young people by pushing them to hide their online activity. In June, Australia's eSafety Commissioner warned that age restrictions might limit young people's access to crucial support and drive them to less regulated services. The body said it would work with government and community groups to improve Australia's approach to online harms affecting safety on platforms at any age. And finally tonight, a nature-inspired wildfire early warning device that will alert the authorities as soon as a fire is detected could be the key to prevent ubiquitous wildfires across the world. The innovation engineered by a team of experts at the Royal College of Art and Imperial College London has won the prestigious annual James Dyson Award in the United Kingdom. The pine cone-like device called Pyrie and made from bio-based materials can send out a radio signal alert to warn of the danger of wildfires when exposed to it. The team experimented with over 20 prototypes to produce the award-winning model. As climate change increases hot and dry conditions, wildfires are spreading faster than ever before. But what if we could detect them early? That's what this device hopes to do. This is Pyre, a nature-inspired device crafted from bio-based materials. When it is exposed to a wildfire, its heat trigger transmitter activates, sending out a radio signal alert to warn of the danger. Pyre was created by a team of students from the Innovation Design Engineering program run jointly by the Royal College of Art and Imperial College London. The battery-powered Pyre pod has been designed specifically for remote and vulnerable communities. It can be deployed from the ground or air, either thrown out of an aircraft or dropped on the forest floor by hand, where it can wait without running out of power. 
It uses artificial intelligence to cross-reference the location of the signal with existing weather and satellite data, allowing for the prediction of potential wildfire spread. Alerts are sent out to emergency responders and at-risk communities, allowing for quick evacuations and firefighting efforts. The device has already claimed the prestigious James Dyson Award in the UK, but still needs further testing on the ground. Well, that is all we have for you tonight on World News. Tune in again tomorrow for more key updates from across the globe. Well, stay tuned as Sanavi Mudan Naika will join you shortly with next with the Nightly Business Report. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.